Hello and welcome to the November Crane Research Forum. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are glad that you are here. Uh, my name is Dr. Rebecca Dorr and I'm the Director of Research here at the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. My colleague Kathy is going to be monitoring our chat box today and we'll be adding housekeeping items there, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, these monthly forums feature research on emerging or key topics that impact the field of early child care and education. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Zainab Saigon. Dr. Saigon is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at The Ohio State University. Her research looks at how specific brain areas become responsible for particular cognitive functions and how traumatic injury can change that. Her research remarkably has shown that brain scans alone can break a child's outcomes, including delays in reading and dyslexia. Today, Dr. Saigon will discuss how the Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience Laboratory at OSU uses MRIs to study babies and young children. She will also share findings on how individual differences in language, executive function, and reading emerge in the brain in ways that this research can inform prevention and intervention. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Saigon. Many thanks, Rebecca. All right, so... Okay. All right, thanks for having me here. Um, okay, so I usually like to start out by uh, having a video of uh, a newborn because many of you may have not um, seen a newborn in some time. And as you can see, you know, her, she's sleeping, her eyes are moving around. Um, she's probably experiencing REM sleep. You know, maybe she's dreaming. Um, the question is, what is she dreaming about, right? What is she thinking? What does she know and who will she become? Um, these are questions that humans have asked themselves for centuries, right? What makes me, me? Is it what I was born with or is it my experiences that really shaped me? Um, it's the classic nature versus nurture debate. So to formalize these questions, um, we can ask how much of the human mind is determined at birth and how do we gain new skills that are uniquely human? And is there a limit to our potential based on the neural stuff that we are born with? Um, and so we're now at the point where we can, you know, start to answer some of these questions. Um, we can actually test these hypotheses and we can do experiments that we could only dream about doing um, 40 to, to 50 years ago. So let's see if we can start to answer some of these questions with brain imaging. Um, so here is an MRI scanner um, and we can use it to take pictures of the brain. So this is what I'm going to refer to as non-invasive neuroimaging. Um, and we can get these types of images from it. We can get nice, you know, beautiful pictures of brain anatomy, um, seeing where different brain regions are. We can look at white matter, which connects brain regions to, to each other. We can look at gray matter, which are the neurons and cell bodies. Um, we can also uh, use the MRI to get images of brain function. So we can see what each brain region is doing um, when you're performing a mental task in the scanner. We can also get images of brain connectivity. So um, this is called a diffusion weighted imaging or DWI scan. Um, and it just tells us what uh, brain regions are connected to each other and how um, the, like the white matter tracks that help get from point A to point B in the brain. So using all these neuroimaging methods, um, here is what we know about the adult brain. So, um, here is an adult brain and I inflated all of the crevices such that we can see like the whole the entire surface of the brain unfolded. Um, and then I turned it around so that we're looking at the underbelly. So we're looking at it on this, like the underside of the, the brain. Here is the front of the head and the back of the head, right? So we know that the adult brain has a, a very rich organization um, and specific brain areas do very specific mental tasks. Like, so we have these brain regions in the visual um, cortex, which is at the bottom of the brain. Um, so these areas help us perceive faces and know who it is that we're looking at. So if you don't have these um, regions due to like a stroke or a lesion, um, you are unable to uh, recognize who it is that, that you're looking at. So super important area. Um, we also have brain areas dedicated to object processing, like general uh, object processing. So knowing that we're looking at a clock, for example. Um, we also have areas that are dedicated to perceiving scenes um, and navigating the world around us. So we have a GPS system nicely built into to our brain. We also, um, I'll talk about this region a whole lot today. So this is the visual word form area. It's again, a visual region. So it's at the base of the brain. 
and it's the, um, the area that helps us perceive um, and recognize text and orthography. And um, other brain regions in, in yellow here um, are on the like lateral side of the brain, what we call on the outside. Um, so these regions help us understand what it is that we're reading, what people are saying, um, and they let us talk and, and communicate with each other. So apart from these um, rather uh, what we call domain specific regions, we also have other brain areas that are more general, right? So these regions um, in dark green, help us attend to things in our environment and they help us filter out irrelevant stuff. Um, and these areas are thought to be a bit more general purpose. So when you're doing something hard, when you're trying to focus um, hard on something, no matter what, uh, these uh, areas in dark green are activated. And these regions are present in almost every adult that we scan um, and they're located in approximately the same spot. So what drives this functional organization, right? Does this organization already exist at birth? Um, my overarching hypothesis is yes. So this, I think this organization already exists and that connectivity of these brain areas is really what defines their jobs. Um, so some regions are functional right off the bat and um, uh, you know, due to evolutionary pressure, like for you know, recognizing your mother's face, for example, and then other regions um, are predisposed for their function, right? Because of their underlying connectivity. So even if babies, you know, of course, don't have a reading area, um, I'll argue here that this region is already connected to the right um, folks and that it is predisposed to becoming a reading area because of who it's talking to, to these connections. So we're now at the point where we can test this um, and, and other hypotheses. So we can peek inside the baby's brain. We can compare this baby to other babies um, and we can use computational modeling and artificial intelligence to try to predict things like future outcome and behavior in each individual baby. And we can test how accurate these predictions are um, and we can test how well neuroanatomy and connectivity at birth predict um, later brain organization and behavior in each child. So imagine being able to know, you know what is it that your baby's thinking about and how you might be able to help them reach their highest potential. It would, it would truly be revolutionary. Um, so this, uh, this you know, research on understanding how early neuroanatomy determines later mental function, all this is important because it answers these fundamental questions that you know, almost everyone asks themselves, right? What makes me, me? How do my experiences shape me? Um, also, what makes me unique? It also offers insight into uniquely human cognition um, and how our brain lets us do these amazing things like, like talk, read, um, write, and, and learn from, from others. So this developmental work also informs um, basic science more broadly. So we can test things like, are the neural mechanisms for a particular mental faculty online early um, and why, right? Why this mental function versus others? We can compare neural uh, mechanisms that underlie different mental representations. We can see if they are distinct um, or whether the development of one mental faculty actually helps the development of another. And we can see, are they similarly impacted in disorders or with brain injury? Um, this work also has practical applications for education. So being able to predict things like you know, reading ability or math um, would be super important, super important for adaptive education, right? So um, understanding the underlying computations of the neural tissue that, you know, for example, supports reading, um, this would be very important for priming the system early on. Um, and knowing what types of pre-literacy skills to focus on when teaching reading. And then finally, this has broad um, practical, uh, other practical and clinical applications like you know, predicting disorders um, even before they are apparent um, or before the relevant skill can be measured, like in the case of reading. Um, all of this can help us develop specific interventions even before a child starts having trouble. Um, things like intervention and targeted practice will, will improve the quality of life um, and may even perhaps prevent the development of certain disorders. Okay, 
So this work is you know, important for uh, a whole lot of reasons that I just outlined, but it does take a lot to scan kits. Um, they move a lot. It's hard to get non-blurry pictures of the brain. So we, of course, you know, don't use sedation or anything invasive because we're studying healthy development. Um, my lab spent a good amount of time trying to figure out the best way to collect this data. And we now have a set of protocols that we implement that we've converged on. For babies, we, scan, we wait for them to fall asleep and we scan them. Um, we swaddle them, mom feeds them, and once they um, are asleep, we move them to the scanner and an experimenter is there with the infant throughout the scan. So this is me scanning my own newborn. Um, and for toddlers and children, we do as much as we can to prep them before they come in. So we send kids a video of what to expect. Um, we also have a space mission theme and a mission map. Um, we put stickers at each step as we complete, we complete that step. Um, we do lots of practice on the games and the, the experiments that we'll do in the scanner. So we practice that a lot beforehand. Um, and we also practice in the mock scanner to get them used to staying still so that the brain pictures are not blurry. And apart, um, and we also bring Scruffy the scan dog, of course. And uh, we compensate our, our participants and their families. Um, we give them small toys after each um, short scan. So, you know, in the hopes that it will motivate and um, keep them keep them going. All right. So um, using all of, um, uh, you know, these, these protocols that we've developed, we study neonates and infants, children, and individuals with developmental disorders. And we use a, a combination of methods, mainly with MRI. Um, we use computational modeling and behavioral assessments, and we um, look at kids both cross-sectionally and follow them across time longitudinally. Um, and all of this is to test how early neuroanatomy determines uniquely human cognition. But you know, first, what do we mean by uniquely human cognition? There are you know, lots of things that one could mean, but maybe one of the things that I think we can hopefully agree on is that um, complex language and abstract reasoning are some of those things that make us um, uh, human and that set us apart from other animals. So um, as Ray Jackendall put it, it's a widespread platitude that we differ from other animals and being smarter and being able to think or reason better. It's another widespread platitude that we differ from other animals and having language. So it's not surprising to, to draw a connection between the two. The connection between language and thought seems obvious. Of course, language helps us think, but how much of our increased reasoning power is specifically due to language? And I'm going to reframe the question to say, are language and thought the same thing? As in, are they represented the same way in the brain? And I'm going to approach this from the developmental standpoint and ask, is neural machinery for language distinct from other thought in early childhood? Um, and I'll talk about the difference between language representation and a, a facet of executive function, um, working memory in, in early childhood. And then I'll ask, how does human cortex develop specificity for new cultural inventions like written language? Um, and I'll test whether connectivity is an early neural marker of reading and ask, can connectivity predict where the uh, visual word form area will land in children and newborns? And then can connectivity predict future reading difficulty? <clears throat> All right. So um, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, so these are uh, language regions you know, in, in yellow and they're on um, this uh, lateral aspect of the brain. And you may have previously heard that language is represented by the left brain, which would be correct. Um, we can get a bit more specific with fMRI and we can use uh, the following task. So you can get participants to read sentences in the scanner um, and you can compare their brain activity to when they were reading sentences to when they were reading non-word lists. Um, and if you do this, you get robust activation in these six regions along frontal. So this is the front of the brain, back of the brain. So this is frontal cortex and in temporal cortex right here. Um, so with this contrast, you get these, these nice regions. And here is the activation of one of these regions to sentences um, and non-word sentences. 
So fMRI and neural activity is, is kind of an arbitrary unit. So we're looking at how much activation there is for one condition versus another, right? So we're looking at this difference. Um, and what we see is that these regions are activated more for meaningful sentences than non-words um, that are presented either uh, visually or if they are presented auditorily. So you can have someone um, listen to uh, the, the same sentences or passages, um, and you can also compare them to non-words, and you can get the same uh, uh, language areas that are activated, right? So these areas are amodal. Um, and this is a, a more recent paper that looked at um, over 800 subjects and, and how their brain responds to um, uh, this type of, of contrast. And um, what I want you to take away is that, so we see the same frontal and temporal regions um, across uh, uh, different experiments. So across these 800 subjects, things were slightly different, but overall you get the same language network that's activated. Um, by and large, these uh, regions are left lateralized, so they're usually on the left more than on the right. And um, what I also want to note is that the location of um, the language cortex is slightly different across subjects. So the exact same spot doesn't activate in everyone, so we can't just like eyeball um, the language network. We need to do the task in, in each individual, but overall, it's in roughly the same spot, right? Like three regions here and three regions here. Um, and it's, it's really cool because all languages do seem to activate the same cortex. So no matter what language, um, they seem to elicit the same language network, even sign language does. And um, it's lateralized, like I said, and it doesn't matter if the stimuli are presented visually or auditorily, so it's amodal. Um, and so all of this suggests that perhaps the neural basis of language is pre-programmed um, and present very early on in development. All right, so when does language cortex develop and specialized? Um, perceptual learning starts in utero. By the third trimester, we know that fetuses can hear. And um, when they are born, it turns out that they prefer mom's voice and language over others. So they might be primed already to this language. And initially babies can distinguish among non-native phonemes. Um, so babies uh, in Japan can hear the raw versus law difference very early on, but then between the ages of six to 12 months, children tune to their native language. So they keep sensitivity to their native phonemes and they lose sensitivity to non-native phonemes. Um, and yet language skills are underdeveloped even by age five, right? So um, we asked, do young children have specialized language cortices just like adults do? So what we did um, is we scanned uh, uh, kids, um, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally. Kids were two to nine years old. Um, they listened to spoken sentences um, versus non-word sentences, our control condition, just like before. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, we tried to capture individual variability. So we use what we call precision fMRI to define each child's network based on how their brain responds, right? So we would expect um, based on like a lot of studies that um, language activation would be here. But if you look across subjects, their exact location differs somewhat. So we're using um, a child's own brain activity to define their own language network. Okay, so here's what we get. Um, here's an example, two-year-old, four-year-old, and five-year-old. Um, the black, and we're looking at the left side of the brain, again, front here, back here, frontal cortex, temporal cortex. Um, and the black outlines depict uh, the search space of activation based on previous studies in adults. Um, and what we see is that, you know, very uh, uh, early on, you know, by age two, um, the, the brain does seem to be activated more for meaningful sentences than to control conditions. So here it is when we quantify this, so that we're looking at selectivity to language of each of these different areas. And we find that um, uh, for most of these regions, we get very nice selectivity to language. 
um, and it does seem to be more on the left than on the right. So by the age of two, children have specialized um, left lateralized language regions, just like adults. So next we wondered, are these regions actually specific for language or are they engaged in other high level thought and processing as well? So this brings us to executive control. Um, so there was this discovery in the uh, early 1900s about how seemingly dissimilar abilities like you know, math and music, um, that they were strongly positively correlated. So this suggested that there might be this general um, factor G or fluid intelligence that contributes to success on any task. And that is the concept of um, executive function or control. So the ability to exert mental effort to successfully complete a complex task. Um, things that require like heavy lifting the brain. And it involves um, working memory, like keeping items online and in short-term memory. Um, it involves being able to shift from one type of task to another um, and being able to inhibit habitual responses to fulfill your goal, things like that. Things that you know kids are notoriously bad at. And in adults, um, we know that executive control involves this network in dark green. I mentioned it in the beginning of the talk. So if you take the harder condition versus the easier condition of a demanding cognitive task, no matter what, um, this executive control network is activated. So because of this, um, we sometimes refer to this network as the multiple demand or MD network. Um, so this is all great, but you may notice that this dark green executive control network um, surrounds the, the language network, right? Um, in adults, uh, the language cortex is distinct from MD cortex. So language cortex, um, as, as defined here, does, um, you know, it doesn't really care about how difficult the task is. Um, and it really doesn't seem to be active at all for all of these different things. So for math, spatial working memory, verbal working memory, it could care less. Um, but it certainly does care a whole lot about meaningful linguistic content um, in the form of sentences um, versus non-words. Um, and that is in stark contrast to an adjacent region, um, which is in MD cortex, right? So here's what we were looking at with language. And then here is the MD region. Um, MD cortex does care about task difficulty, is activated more to the hard than the easy condition um, across all of these different uh, uh, complex tasks. And it's not really um, driven by linguistic content. And in fact, it responds more to non-words than it does to sentences, um, probably because it's the harder of the two conditions to discern. Okay, so language is distinct from MD cortex in adults. What about kids? So is language distinct from other thought in early childhood? After all, we know that language skills are really not well developed until later on in um, childhood. What's a lion say? Laura, what's a lion say? Ah! Ah! All right, so... Um, as you see, uh, language skills, you know, do need some work. And you may have also noticed she's very distractible, right? Um, so maybe executive function is also um, developing in this time. So even though we saw selectivity to language in young kids, it is possible that adult-like neural specialization from language may develop from a more general cortex that, you know, facilitates general learning. So um, in that case, we might expect um, that the two systems overlap. And specifically, we might expect that language regions would be selective to both language and task difficulty, whereas MD regions would be also selective to task difficulty and perhaps also show similar selectivity to linguistic structure. <clears throat> okay, so in the same kids that we did the language task on, we also did a spatial working memory task um, where we showed them a bunch of grids with colored squares that were lit up. And um, they, were, they were asked to keep these squares in memory. And then they were asked which of these two grids <clears throat> show all the squares that were lit up. So it would obviously be this one. You guys are smart. Um, so we had a hard and an easy condition for this task. So either two squares were lit up at a time, 
um, or one square. So, you know, with two squares, you have <clears throat> a bit more, more items to hold in working memory. Um, whereas with one square, you have fewer items. So thus the hard versus easy conditions. All right, so what, you know, how do their brains activate these tasks? So here is one subject's activation on the language task. Um, we have the right hemisphere over here, left hemisphere here, um, front of the brain, and then back of the brain. So here's that same subject's activation to the spatial working memory task. Um, you can see that the language task is clearly activating left frontal and um, temporal cortex, but the MD task seems to be a bit more right lateralized, and it's clearly avoiding um, the regions in black which indicate where the language areas should land. <clears throat> when we quantify this, we find exactly what we would expect from adults, that language regions are selective to linguistic content, um, and they're not responsive um, uh, or selective to cognitive effort in a working memory task. So language regions do not respond to multiple demand. And this is in contrast to multiple demand regions you really don't care about linguistic content. So here they are. Um, here's the you know, different regions, frontal regions and parietal regions. And we can clearly see that um, these, these uh, MD regions are very much driven by the spatial working memory task, but they really do not care about linguistic content. So MD regions do not respond to language. Um, and we brought these kids back after a year and we scanned them again. So this is longitudinal data. Um, one subject's time point one, another, uh, and the same subject's time point two. Here's another subject, time point one and time point two. And what we found is that language selectivity increased across time. So this is the change in selectivity. Um, but we also found that these regions were not, you know, they didn't become any more selective to executive control. So we see a longitudinal increase in language selectivity, which is not related to executive control. And then finally, we looked at the connectivity of the language network in blue um, to itself versus to the MD network in orange. So we asked, does this region, does this blue region talk more um, with other blue regions, even the ones far away, um, or does it talk more with orange MD regions right next to it? And what we found is that um, language connectivity to itself was much higher than um, to MD cortex. So even though MD cortex basically surrounds the language network, the two networks are decidedly distinct and they communicate more with themselves than with um, adjacent but functionally distinct cortex. All right, so um, we asked whether the neural machinery for language was distinct from other thought in early childhood, and we found that yes, it, it really is. Um, specifically, we found a double dissociation between language and, and MD, so there might be innately determined uh, mechanisms that facilitate language development so that it's online and is specifically tuned for linguistic content very early on in life. And um, the developmental mechanisms that help boost cognitive control um, as, as kids get older, these are independent of these more domain-specific language cortex. Okay. So next I'm gonna ask, how does oral language, which we talked about, how does this facilitate a child's ability to learn and comprehend written language? <laughs> So how is this babbling helping her visual cortex learn to read? Um, so that's exactly what I'll talk about in the next section. So I'll switch to written language and reading, and I'll ask how our brain um, uh, develops specificity for new cultural inventions. So I'll ask, can connectivity predict where this reading area will develop? So um, there's a part of the brain that's dedicated to orthography called the visual word form area or VWFA, and it's critically involved in reading. So it responds more um, to words and letter strings uh, here than it does to like line drawings of objects um, and other visual stimuli. And it only responds to the orthography that the participant can read. So 
not to Hebrew, for example, for English readers. And this region is, is located in you know, roughly the same spot, no matter what language or culture. So here's the BWFA um, in magenta. And you know, of course, there's some variability in this location because you know, there are differences in the brain across people, but it usually lands in this left um, bottom visual cortex. But you may be asking yourself, well, reading is a relatively recent cultural invention. So any um, cortical specialization for reading could not have arisen through natural selection alone. So the question is, why does this piece of cortex become word selective? Why does it develop in that particular area? One possibility, of course, is that it could be the connectivity of this piece of cortex. So there could be specialized connectivity patterns for example, with language regions that determine the location of a word selective visual area. And what makes reading and the VWFA a great domain to study is that the VWFA does not exist before reading. So it, it exists as in the neural tissue, of course, exists, but the cells in this area um, don't really know the difference between like words and other visual stimuli. So we say that the brain area that's dedicated to reading doesn't exist in, in preliterate um, kids and adults, but there may already be connections, um, the right type of connections of this area that set, set it up to become a VWFA. So we tested this by looking at connectivity um, of the region before and after reading acquisition. So we scanned kids before they knew how to read um, at age five, and we brought them back in at age eight after they could read, and we scanned them to pinpoint the exact location of the VWFA. We showed them words um, and control visual conditions rather than like eyeballing the potential you know, location of the VWFA. We um, more precisely pinpointed this location in each child. And we asked um, whether these specialized connections exist even before a child knows how to read, and then do they actually facilitate the development of um, uh, specialization for written words? And we performed a, a method um, called connectivity fingerprint predictions. So we used this method in previous work to predict individual variability in where um, category selective cortex will land, like face areas and so on. Um, and we used each individual's unique connectivity data or their connectivity fingerprint to pinpoint where um, these brain areas are. So we um, use this method here with kids and we tried to predict fMRI data at age eight. So we acquired connectivity data in five-year-olds and brought them back in at age eight to get fMRI word selectivity data. And we pinpointed their VWFA. And we mapped their age eight fMRI to the same child's age five brain. And we paired age five connectivity with age eight fMRI for each subject. And we learned the relationship between connectivity at age five and word selectivity at age eight in one set of subjects. And we simply applied the model we learned to a new subject's um, connectivity data to predict their uh, uh, word selectivity. Okay, so here is a participant's actual fMRI activation. So again, we're looking at the underbelly of the brain. This is visual cortex, um, and they this is this is uh, activation for when the child is seeing words, and word selective cortex is going to be here. So we know that it's going to be here because we scanned this this child at age eight. Um, and word selective cortex is going to show up here. So we should be able to, connectivity at age five should be able to predict it here. And this is what is predicted from that same child's connectivity data alone at age five. So we can see that, you know, a lot of the word selective clusters can be very nicely predicted um, from a child's brain scan at an earlier age. And this is pretty crazy because we um, also checked to make sure there was you know, no selectivity for letters um, in this region at age five. And you know, we didn't find any, any reason to suspect that this tissue was any different than its neighbors because of how it responds. But 
despite that, there does seem to be some difference um, in this neural tissue's connections to the rest of the brain that predicts that it will become more selective later on. So we can use a brain scan at an early age to predict where in the brain of each individual child a reading area will eventually show up. Um, and when we looked at the model to see, you know, what are the connections that make, um, that allow us to predict a word selective area, we find that this brain tissue is already connected to a set of other brain regions like language regions that set it up to become selective to written words. But, you know, this evidence isn't entirely satisfactory, right? These kids have definitely been read to, right? They probably recognize letters and they've had exposure to text. Um, so next we explored whether this connectivity pattern was already present at birth. So, um, you know, when you're asleep or you might be spacing out right now, even when you're spacing out, your brain is always active and busy. Um, and it turns out that brain regions that are involved in similar mental functions um, fluctuate together. They go up and down um, or they are functionally connected, as we like to call them. It turns out when a baby's asleep, um, this is what's going on in their brain. So uh, we looked at functional connectivity in neonates while they're asleep and we compared it to um, connectivity scans in adults to see if this network that we identified earlier, whether or not this is innate. So we looked at the um, connectivity of language cortex with visual cortex in neonates scanned within a, a week of birth. And um, we also compared it to adults. And we found that neonates, just like adults, have a region in visual cortex, so the hot spots here, these regions connect more with language cortex. Um, and these, these hotspots tend to be in the location that will later develop into the visual word form area. So the language network is more connected with neural tissue that will later become a reading area than with any other area in the neighborhood. So um, the region that will later develop uh, orthographic selectivity is already connected to language cortex even at birth. So pre-existing connectivity may very well be a way for a visual area to become um, language or word selective. So now I'm going to turn to the um, last example that I'll talk about today. So I'll ask if connectivity can help predict later behavior and clinical outcome. And specifically, we looked at whether we could predict which child would show um, reading difficulty or develop dyslexia. We know um, uh, from previous work that there appears to be circuitry inside the brain that is different in older kids um, who have dyslexia. So certain tracts that, are, that I colored here. So these tracts are the um, uh, information highways that help connect different brain areas. Um, so these tracts specifically tend to be different in children and adults who have dyslexia. One of the more important tracts is this arcuate fasciculus, which is in yellow here. Um, so this is the uh, 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 side view of the brain. This is looking top down at the brain. Um, so the arcuate fasciculus is particularly important because it's the one that we think connects um, frontal and temporal language areas. So we wanted to know, um, are these you know, differences that previous studies have found in, in adults and kids with dyslexia, are these differences the cause or consequence of dyslexia? Are any of these tracts different in preliterate kids who may go on to develop dyslexia? If they are, it could mean that these differences are perhaps causal, um, and at the very least, they could be biomarkers of dyslexia. And what we found is that um, the volume of a, of a particular white matter tract, the left arcuate fasciculus, um, it correlates with a pre-reading measure of dyslexia, um, phonemic blending, the ability to blend phonemes together. So um, if we render a few subjects as left arcuate in 3D, it, we can easily visualize this effect of volume by phonemic blending. So this is the arcuate extracted from um, a child with better phonemic ability, this is much larger than a child uh, uh, with poor phonemic um, uh, ability. So the differences in the um, reading circuitry for dyslexia may exist even before a child starts to read. And so 
um, with this, maybe we can make predictions about who may go on to develop dyslexia um, using uh, MRI data even before they know how to read. And this can potentially help introduce earlier interventions and it might help um, prevent issues with years of, of struggling to read. Okay. Um, to summarize, our overarching question was, how does the architecture of the mind arise? So we found strong evidence that connectivity and early neuroanatomy drives the organization of the mind and brain. And this is especially the case for domain-specific cortex. I showed that the neural machinery for language was online early, um, it's specialized and it's left lateralized, and it's very distinct from other thought in early childhood. So this suggested that thought and language are, are in fact very distinct and that um, the two constructs do not equal one another. I also showed that um, early connectivity can predict skills like uh, reading, which develop a bit later. And that's, you know, I think it's pretty spectacular because what it means is we could use non-invasive neuroimaging to predict what the brain will look like years from now. We also went even earlier and looked at neonate scans and found that even at birth, um, this rich circuitry was largely set up, suggesting that innate mechanisms may determine what the brain will do years later. I then showed that not only can we predict the organization of the brain as it develops, but we can also predict learning and behavior using early brain scans, um, which might potentially help uh, with, with issues reading even before um, a child starts to have trouble. So all of this suggests that connectivity drives the organization of brain and mind, and that maybe we can use connectivity as a, as a neural marker for the development of new skills. I also show that there's you know, certainly a way that experience can, can shape the development of cortex, and that's especially the case for domain general regions, um, like those for executive function. I, you know, I didn't have time to go into it too, too much, but um, I did show that, you know, that this uh, executive function was supported by a distinct cortex, uh, uh, distinct from language cortex in early childhood. Um, but some stuff I didn't show is that um, what we found is that uh, uh, this executive function network shows prolonged development in early childhood, and this might mirror the development of executive control in each child. Um, and other work from uh, my lab has also shown that this is the case for neonates. So this domain general cortex is actually one of the most connectionally immature networks at birth. Um, and it's the, the most variable network um, among the 130 neonates that we looked at. So we think that um, this might reflect protracted plasticity of, uh, of executive function regions. And we're exploring this by looking at brain lesions um, as well as brain injury at different time points in development. Um, and we're also looking at how connectivity of this tissue predicts individual variability in later cognitive control. Okay, so some ongoing um, and future work that we're doing now, um, it, so we're continuing to build these more and more accurate models of, of early brain data to predict future function. And we're not only using connectivity, but we're also using neural specialization. Um, and we're not only predicting reading, but also trying to go for math, executive control, and academic readiness. Um, and what these models give us is not only accurate predictions, but also helps us identify key regions and connections that give us the most accurate predictions. So they help us um, pinpoint neural markers of uh, later typical and atypical development. Um, another line of work is to look at what these regions are doing prior to specialization. So for the VWFA, for example, we're looking at the pre-literate VWFA and we're scanning preschoolers um, uh, as they watch short movies to try to understand pre-existing um, neural selectivity and what this region is doing before literacy. So we show them short movies. Um, we try to pull out what these regions are doing. Um, so maybe the VWFA likes um, certain combinations of symbols or likes visual things that are curvy but not blocky, or um, they might respond to, you know, seeing a mouth sound out words. I don't know, right? So on. Um, but it would be nice to know what these regions like um, so that we can inform uh, research into their curriculums to help 
you know, bolster their development. Um, and finally, we're looking at plasticity due to intervention and injury. So one question we're interested in is how um, preschool intervention strengthens uh, uh, connectivity and, and selectivity of these regions. So we know that early intervention helps with, with for example, reading difficulty, but um, does some types of intervention work better than others? Um, does it strengthen the expected pathways and connections or does it mediate through another pathway? Um, we can understand what the intervention does and how it impacts the brain so that we can better target and focus these interventions. We're also interested in how pediatric or sports-related neurotrauma impacts typical development of, of these pathways. Um, I mentioned that we're looking at the prolonged development of the executive function network um, and perhaps looking at how it might explain how susceptible it is to brain injury. But we're also looking at um, how, how well we can predict uh, which child is more prone to suffer from uh, sports-related neurotrauma based on what their neural data looks like before they start um, tackle football, for example. And we're also exploring um, what types of treatment might help a, a child based on um, their neural data. Okay, um, that's all I have for today. I'd like to thank um, uh, the uh, Ohio Supercomputer Cluster for allowing us to do these really powerful computations, um, as well as our funding sources and special thanks to the children and families who participated in this research. Um, come check out our lab if you're in the area uh, and um, feel free to, to visit our website and email me with, with any thoughts and questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sagan, for an interesting presentation. We do have some questions um, coming in the Q&A box, but if others um, come up as folks are, are processing um, the information you've heard today, please add them there. Um, one question was about whether you've looked at any differences between children um, pre-pandemic and, and post-pandemic, and I think the specific interest here was in relation to um, toddlers or young children who were born early in the pandemic and might have been exposed to a lot of daycare workers that are masked and how that might affect language development in these areas. Um, I have not, uh, and but I agree that would be a very interesting um, uh, path to go on. And um, so that is, you know, assuming that a key component of, of language acquisition is um, being able to see, you know, what is being mouthed, how that is, is being um, vocalized, um, and pairing that with the auditory output. Um, and so I, I think that's an interesting, you know, place to go. Um, I think there are so many, so kids are such, you know, learners, right? Um, and they will use any and all bits of information that is available to them. And you know, keep in mind that daycare is a is a chunk of the day, but it's not. It's certainly not like the maybe the most important or the most primary type of um, uh, uh, you know linguistic input to to early childhood development. So, I think there are maybe some subtle differences, but you know, I'm almost positive that these children uh, will use other cues and and will certainly use their um, caregivers who are not wearing masks, for example, to, to help bolster their, their language development. Yeah, thank you. One question I had um, going through your presentation, or you mentioned something about, um, you're thinking about the predictors of dyslexia and the difference, it, and I was wondering if you could talk about um, the difference between the brain connectivity being a causal factor in prediction of dyslexia versus a biomarker of dyslexia. What is that? Can you talk a little bit more about what that means for our audience? Um, so, it, it may not be, the, the differences that we find may not necessarily be what leads to uh, the, the deficits in, in dyslexia. Um, and, you know, at, at certain points in development, we might expect different pathways to be um, more or less susceptible, right? So perhaps in early development, the arcuate, which I just showed, maybe that's the, the neural marker to really hone in on. But perhaps um, later on in, in development, when um, uh, for example, you know, working memory is, is more important in trying to read and, and trying to form um, uh, representations of words. So maybe other pathways are online then. So in that sense, um, it, I guess it, what I'm trying to say is that it depends on when we look for these neural markers and what we've shown here might be specific to this age range that, that, that we're looking at. Right, that makes sense. 
The other thing um, that you mentioned that I thought our audience might be interested in hearing more about is um, the implications for what curriculums might look like to boost uh, bolster development based on what the region's like um, early in development. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, what you think that implication is for curriculum development. Yeah, so if um, I'm, I'm hoping that most curriculum are, are now more phonemic based, um, and so a, a huge emphasis is put on how to put phonemes together, how to take them apart, um, and focusing on the you know different components of auditory words, breaking them down into different um, units, and trying to pair that with with visual um, uh, uh, stimuli. Um, but maybe uh, in addition to that, you know, other ways of presenting words might be a, a, an important um, additional factor. It might be important to um, uh, to demonstrate, you know, how these different sounds um, can can group together, but also look at how, for example, um, uh, visual word units are, are, you know, how how we can go from like a phoneme to a, a more grapheme um, uh, representation. So by maybe by pairing um, units like you know letters, groups of letters, um, and sound units we might uh, better be able to, to, uh, to bolster reading. Uh, maybe another thing, you know, <laughs> is how to present um, words, like what is the ideal word length, um, mm -hmm. this age range, um, how many uh, uh, word pairs are, um, uh, are recognizable and distinct in this age range, right? Based on what we see in the BWFA. Um, so, you know, it may be the case that maybe two, two letter words are an ideal um, thing to teach at, at age five, for example, whereas um, uh, earlier on, it may be more important to um, look at whole words, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah, it's basically like some of those um, potential variations in curriculum could be adjusted based on what you're seeing in the brain scans early on. And that potentially could sort of help support the development of that brain area that we know is going to be important for later reading. Is that the idea? Yeah. yeah. So by knowing what it is, what this region is looking for, what it likes, um, we can feed it that information um, and, and try to, to help it help it along. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. We just had a question come in that um, was something I was thinking about as well from, from Angela um, about MRIs and uh, what the pros and cons are. And if you think, you know, you talked about how hard this work is with little kids and then also the implications being maybe we should do this more with little kids um, so that we can inform uh, early intervention. So can you talk, she asked about whether there's any harm that comes from MRIs and how do we balance that? And my question was really like, this is really hard and expensive. Are we really gonna be doing this with lots of kids in the future to inform early intervention? And you see, what do you see for the future of, of MRI in, in this work? Great question. Yes, yeah, so it, it's, it's one that I ask myself a lot. Um, so to address the harm aspect, there is, um, there is none, the, uh, it's FDA approved, it's not harmful. As long as there's no metal that is going into the magnet, people are safe. Um, so as long as those, those safety checks are, are performed, we're in good shape. Um, so I, you know, and, but you mentioned they are expensive, <laughs> price are expensive and they're long um, and they are uh, prone to artifact from movement. So, um, you know, what we can do here is is inform you know how these brain pathways are developing, what types of um, input they expect, like I said, and how interventions may change um, these different uh, uh, pathways. And so, in that way, we can use this neural information to sculpt um, intervention and, and training programs. Um, so that's on the training and practice side of things. But on the um, identification, right, like and and. Uh, quote unquote diagnosis side of things, um, what I think would be a more informed approach would be to um, only look at kids who perhaps have a family history of dyslexia or mm -hmm. any, um, you know, early educators are, are fairly good at recognizing these signs of, of reading difficulty early on. Um, so if they think there might be an issue. Um, so selecting children based off of potential um, risk factors, I think would be a, a perhaps a better way to go. Um, we're also looking at other non-invasive neuroimaging methods um, that are more portable that we can uh, uh, take with us um, and that, you know, may not require a visit to OSU. Um, and so, you know, 
be be tuned for that for that work. We're still we're working on those. Okay. The next next time you come and give us <laughs> give us a talk at the research forum, we'll ask you about that. Great. Thank you. Um, I thought your work about um, the differentiation between the executive function areas and the language areas were really interesting. I wonder if you could talk about why you think those um, abilities are so highly correlated in children, given how different different the brain areas looked like in your research. Uh, say that again. The which I mean, they are really highly correlated, right? Like kids who have higher language skills tend to have higher executive function skills. So, can you talk about any any um, thoughts you have on why that might be, given the differentiation in the brain areas? Um, yeah. So, I you know, I, I talk about how these two things may be distinct and they're represented differently in the brain. Um, that's not to say that they don't interact. So, I, I do think that language um, informs executive function, um, and certainly both are are highly involved in reading, right? So um, working memory is a, a big part of, of fluid reading. Um, and so they certainly do interact and they are, um, uh, you know, they may develop in tandem, but their development certainly doesn't um, impact the development of these skills, right? So it's not like executive function is waiting for language to develop before it, it does this thing or vice versa. Right. Um, so, you know, I think what we're seeing in the behavioral output of, of these different domains is um, uh, one that speaks to their interaction rather than the discrete processing that is going on in the brain. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. We had one question come in about um, whether you looked at other factors that might influence brain development other than the injury and, and um, diagnosis that you've looked at. So for example, age the kids are entering school or what type of care they've been in during early childhood. Are there other differences that, that come out based on those types of factors? That's a big one. I, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a huge question and we're starting small. Um, we would want to go there, but uh, so right now we're looking at, you know, simply brain and how that informs behavior. Mm -hmm. And by making the most accurate models, we can then add in different environmental moderators um, to try to see what, you know, what do they explain in terms of the variance of, of these skills? Um, and, uh, you know, how can we, maybe these are the, the um, moderators that we can target um, for early intervention. Like I see a question in the chat about nutrition, for example, that's mm -hmm. probably a big one. Um, and you know, by by trying to put that into our models as well, it would be interesting to see can we improve our predictions of, of later behavior? And if we can, um, are there things we can do to change things like nutrition early on that might affect um, uh, the course of, of development? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, this has been a really wonderful presentation and conversation. Thank you again for sharing your work with us today, Dr. Sagan. For having me. And thanks to all of our attendees for joining us today as well. Uh, when you leave the meeting today, a very short survey will pop up. Please fill that out if you're able. We really do value your feedback and use it to inform our future events. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.